Hello, thank you for joining and uh, thank you for hosting me and well done for pronouncing my absurdly convoluted surname. Uh, so today I'm here to talk to you about last cryptocurrency recirculation. It's a joint work with my professor, Eli Ben Sasson, whom some of you probably know. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be in this uh, conference today, so I'm here presenting on both of our behalfs. Uh, so a bit of an introduction. Uh, first, a word on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and monetary policy. So Bitcoin is uh, the first widely accepted decentralized cryptocurrency. And its decentralization means that there's no central uh, body governing it. And the problem this raises is in issues of governance, that sometimes you have to find answers to problems such as monetary policy. How do you stabilize a coin? And specifically with Bitcoin, we've seen how volatile it can become. Uh, so an aspect of monetary policy, which we chose to focus on on this paper, was that of recirculating lost cryptocurrencies. And again, we modeled this primarily around the Bitcoin model, but you can sort of take our ideas and transfer them to other cryptocurrencies as well. So what is the problem of lost coin recirculation? It's in fact a problem as old as money itself. For example, you pocket a $10 note that you received as change for a transaction and you go home and forget all about it and throw the pants in the laundry and boom, you're down $10. So how nice would that be if I could just go to the bank and ask for that $10 back? Oh yeah, I, I lost $10, can I just have those $10 back? But of course, that's probably not possible, although I don't know, I never tried. Uh, so the problem with lost coin recirculation is actually divided into two main problems. The first of which is how you actually identify a lost coin. Because again, you can't really trust people to tell you, oh yes, I've lost X amount of dollars, uh, because you can't know for sure if they're telling the truth or not. And the second problem is, even if you know how to identify how many coins are lost, you have to ask yourself then, how do you restore the coins into circulation? Uh, when, you, when you're talking about cryptocurrencies especially, since there's no uh, central authority governing it, we have to find models which are decentralized and are still uh, able to produce the same results we'd expect from a centralized go uh, governing organization. In this regard, we want to make a system that is uh, incentive compatible. And what incentive, incentive compatibility means is that when um, incentive compatibility, when, a, when sorry, <laughs> lost my train of thought. When incent, incentive compatibility, give me one second to revert back. So, Something that is incentive compatible means that in everyone's best interest, even selfish best interest, is to comply with the suggested protocol as we define it. And that is sort of self-regulation because again, we're saying that when everyone's being as selfish as possible, then they are um, basically complying with our protocol. So this raises the question of why even bother restoring lost uh, coins or lost cryptocurrencies? So firstly, what are lost cryptocurrencies? We all know that blockchain is, for, again, with Bitcoin, it's public and transparent. So it's not as if 10 or 100 Bitcoins can just go missing. People know where they are. So essentially, in Bitcoin, you have users. And users in, Bitcoins, in Bitcoin have wallets, which have Bitcoins in them. And a user's access to that wallet is given to him with two keys which are the public key and the secret key. Now, the public key is basically the wallet's address. It can be like the username in Bitcoin. And it's used to basically track the wallet on the blockchain, track the funds that are going into the wallet and funds that are going out. Now again, essentially a user in Bitcoin would want to eventually use that wallet to transact, as in transfer money out of that wallet. But in order to do so, he must be able to produce a viable secret key in order to sign that transaction. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen secret keys in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, but they usually are not very nice or easy to remember. So what happens when the user loses that secret key for whatever reason? 
well, in that case, the user actually loses his ability to ever transfer money out of that wallet. So any money that's in that wallet is essentially now lost forever. This is more of a gaping issue with fixed cap cryptocurrencies. With, current, with cryptocurrencies that don't set a limit on the amount of coins in, that are going to be printed into circulation, this isn't so much a problem because, all right, so some coins are lost, but more are going to be printed in perpetuity. But again, with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which set a, a fixed limit on the amount of coins in circulation, we now have a greater problem. Uh, we recognize that lost coins are a deflationary factor of Bitcoin and other coins as a, a monetary system. Because deflation would be a, a problem that occurs when too little money is chasing too many goods and services. In that regard, prices would, would essentially go down as the purchasing power of individual coins goes up. Uh, so basically what we're looking at is, again, in regards to fixed capital currencies like Bitcoin, we're seeing systems which potentially bleed out coins as, they, uh, as with their existence, and there is no way to currently compensate for that loss. So, for example, with Bitcoin, the protocol dictates that eventually we're going to converge on 20 million Bitcoins in circulation. And really, to this... It, Nowadays, this is a dream. Sure, 21 million Bitcoins are going to be minted, but we're never going to see 21 million Bitcoins in circulation as it is right now. Now, we might say, well, how, how much of a problem that is? I mean, we should be able to trust users that they know what they're doing and that they don't cause any problems. Except that notoriously users aren't very good with managing their secret keys. So just for example, the picture on the right would be uh, Adam Johnson from Bloomberg TV showing his uh, QR code for his secret key on live television. And before that show was over, those coins were lost. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, an article which was posted less than two weeks ago on Bitcoin.com, which seems almost apocalyptic. It's talking about an estimated 36% coins in circulation lost. Now, upon careful reading of the article, you can note that the author actually counted bitcoins that have not yet been minted. So it's a bit of a gross overestimation because coins are not minted, are not lost, technically. But still, there is that problem that we know that there are, or we can basically reliably assume that some coins are probably lost. And this brings me to the bottom where and some guy who had his secret key backed on a flash drive accidentally threw that flash drive away and lost $60 million worth of Bitcoins. Okay, so we can definitely see that it's a problem. And now we want to talk about what we're basically trying to contribute to this. So our contribution is we're going to talk about uh, the restoration of cryptocurrencies without key restoration schemes. So a key restoration scheme would be something like when I go to Gmail to check my emails and I forget my password, I have the I forgot my password again uh, button, which leads me to a way to restore my password. And that is a, an example of a key restoration scheme. Now this works because there's a central party, which is Google, which is basically providing that as a service for me. In cryptocurrencies, this is more of a problem because in cryptocurrencies, either we have a third party we need to somehow trust to keep our secret keys and not exploit them, or we're going to have to have some way in the system itself, the protocol itself, a decentralized way to restore keys, but then that introduces the risk that someone who never owned my wallet will be able to potentially restore the key and steal my coins. Uh, in this paper, we mention uh, two uh, concepts called spring cleaning and proof of claim. Uh, spring cleaning and proof of claim are, uh, together we combine in order to solve the problem of how to identify lost coins. And again, I go back to mention the fact that virtually speaking, there's no real difference between someone who lost a wallet full of coins and someone who never owned that wallet to begin with. And we want to prevent someone from being able to exploit that. Uh, secondly, we introduced uh, what we call a, a coin restoration, a redistribution scheme which is the way in which the lost coins basically re-enter circulation. Uh, 
A similar paper, or a paper tackling the same issue, was uh, published by uh, Yermondrad and Dionysu, at which, and they also addressed the problem of lost cryptocurrencies. In their solution, which we'll talk about later, they were talking about uh, redistributing lost cryptocurrencies towards miners. And our take on that is that that solution would not be incentive compatible as it would incentivize miners to basically exploit the system. So what we're aiming at is we've come up with a scheme, a distribution scheme that basically we can prove uh, corresponds to an incentive compatible solution whereby all participants are actually encouraged to uh, abide by the protocol we suggest. So first, I have to uh, establish some framework in order to be able to uh, discuss the concepts that are going to follow. And the first of which is going to be uh, economic systems. Now, economic systems are, are a broad umbrella we use to define these uh, aggregations of communities where people are willing to exchange goods and services with one another against a certain currency. So in that example, the USA can be an economic system where the entire country is willing to trade their goods and services against the dollar. Or again, the Bitcoin community itself, the, the users of Bitcoin are generally willing to accept Bitcoin as payments for goods and services. Uh, what we're aiming at is a simplistic model that basically encompasses as many of these different economic systems as we can and is easy to explain. And we view it as a rational model. It, that is in order to explain how players are encouraged to, to abide by the algorithm itself. Now, the economic system includes many components, which we'll talk about shortly, those being goods and services, the money supply, and the agents, who are the participants in the uh, economic system. And basically, they're all brought together by one singular goal, which is everyone wants to get rich. Uh, now, the thing about getting rich is that purchasing power is more important than money. And what I mean by that, and I illustrate with an example, is actually, I think these are the unupdated slides, but basically, uh, purchasing power. So what, what I want to illustrate is if you have, for example, a $10 bill versus what in Israel is the 20 shekel bill, then the shekel is a bit of a novelty for Americans, but any Israeli you'd ask would prefer to take the $10 bill over the 20 shekel bill. And why is that? Because, and I don't mean to flaunt my expertise in mathematics, but as far as I remember, 20 is greater than 10. So why would anyone accept $10 over 20 shekels? Well, because with $10 in America, you can get 10 cheeseburgers at McDonald's, whereas in Israel, with a 20 shekel bill, you can get even one which is horrible. And the point is that as humans, we innately understand that money is only as good as what it can provide for us. And again, even for the dollar, if we compare what $10 is worth now to what $10 was worth 100 years ago, we can also see a difference in that purchasing power. So again, our view is that purchasing power is more important than money. Again, when we're talking about coin restoration, which effectively talks about changing the money in circulation, we have to analyze play, players' uh, rationale in regards to their purchasing power over the amount of money they actually hold. Because a player can decide that they're opting to hold less money to have an increased purchasing power. Uh, we regard all participants in the economic system, which we call agents, as rational, uh, but we also assume that their knowledge is imperfect. If you assume perfect knowledge, there isn't a lot you can really say about it. If everyone knows everything, then there's really no point in doing everything. Then, okay, so 10 coins were lost, that's fine. Everything is worth just a fraction bit more. So basically a coin restoration scheme is a way for, to actually correct that misinformation in the system, where one player might know that 10 coins are lost, but the rest don't. So going into the different components that actually uh, comprise the economic system, the first being goods and services. So goods and services are the available re resources in the uh, economic system. Uh, basically, th this can be similar to GDP or, or similar to anything that the participants in the system are willing to trade against the coin itself. Um, Goods and services can be material or otherwise. So I might be willing to trade my car for Bitcoin, and that would be now a good that is traded for Bitcoin. Or I'd be willing to trade hours of work, which is a service. Uh, 
goods and services differ from money due to their inherent utility. So goods and services have some use. I can use food because I eat that to stay alive, or I can use a car to get to places. As for money, for what, it, what constitutes money uh, in, by definition, shouldn't really have utility. It should only have that marginal utility you get as a medium of exchange, as a buffer between transactions. Um, that being said, what, it, what constitutes the system's uh, accepted currency derives its value from the available goods and services. So the more goods and services people are willing to trade for Bitcoin, the higher its prospective value should be. Uh, so f forgive me for the math. I know that uh, computer science has evolved to that stage where we're somehow above math now. But I do want to mention that uh, for simplicity, we do assume that there is some known and measured cor uh, correlation between value and utility uh, for a given good or service. So uh, we assume there's some function that, given a, a certain good or service, would give some amorphic value, and that uh, BTC you see in uh, parentheses was supposed to be taken out of this presentation. But for example, if I execute V over a car, I get four units, and four units will represent some f uh, notion of that car's value in the economic system. Uh, we expand that notion for subsets simply because we sometimes, in our equations, want to talk about an aggregation of goods and services. So say you want to know the value of all the cars and all the tomatoes in the system, it will be the sum value of each individual good and service. Uh, the next component of the uh, economic system is the money supply. So the money supply is the sum total of currency in the economic system. Uh, this again is a currency that is in circulation. So for example, when we talk about uh, the USA, for example, the Fed sits on a lot of dollars that they keep in their vaults and they don't release into circulation. That wouldn't count as money in circulation by our definition. Um, the currency that, we, uh, it, that is represented the economic system, again, is what is widely accepted by the participants in the economic system as a medium of exchange for uh, exchanges of goods and services. Therefore, the value of M is proportional to that of T. So it would be naive to say that all monies equal all things, but there is some correlation that we can see between how much money is in that system versus how many goods and services are provided in it. So we look at each coin's proportional value as uh, the uh, proportion of all the, good, all the value of goods and services in the system divided by all the coins in the system. That would be the value or the purchasing power of a single coin. And what's nice about that is then you can see uh, the uh, effects of the, the changes to the money supply in regards to the coin's purchasing power. So as you'd expect, if the, num if the money supply changes by epsilon, be it positive or negative, you can see either a dilution of the coin's value or uh, an appreciation in value. Uh, finally, and probably most importantly, uh, the factor of the economic system is the agents themselves. And the agents are really the backbone of the economic system in our models. So agents are the entities that are agreeing to participate together in this economic system. And their importance to this model is that they actually are the ones that, first and foremost, are willing to accept the given currency as a medium of exchange. So what we're saying is basically all money is divided somehow between all the participants in the system. That's what this uh, formula is trying to capture. And secondly, the agents are actually the ones who are bringing the goods and services to the table. So every day when another person is willing to join Bitcoin and willing to accept Bitcoin as a form of payment, they're bringing their goods and services to the table and basically increasing the coin's value. Um, finally, I'm talking about uh, something I call agents of change. Now, uh, agents of change uh, basically uh, addresses the, the question of how money enters the system. So again, since agents are the ones that actually comprise the economic system, they're the infrastructure that the economic system is built on, then money in circulation, or money that enters circulation, or leaves circulation, actually leave, enters and leaves through a given set of agents within the system. So we denote these agents as a subset, A tag, of A. And if the money supply was changed by epsilon, again, be it negative or positive, 
you can expect that to change and that subset. So every agent in, the, in that subset either receives or loses a certain amount of coins to reflect that change in the money supply. This all leads us to what we want to explain, which is a, a, a function we call purchasing power. And purchasing power is defined as the financial ability to procure uh, goods and services. Uh, so for agents, we define purchasing power as a function which, given an agent, it calculates whatever that agent's purchasing power is. So the purchasing power would be that agent's account, which we denote as XA, uh, times the coin's proportional value, which is C. And a nice thing that we get out of that is that when you expand it for uh, subsets and you calculate the purchasing power of all the agents in the system, you're basically saying that the purchasing power of all the agents in the system is basically worth the entire value of the goods and services, which is to say everyone's as rich as everyone. Um, so we recognize that the primary incentive of participants in economic systems is to maximize purchasing power. Uh, so the reason is, again, when prices are stable, you, you translate this to, okay, so I want to have more money because more money means I'm richer. But when you discuss uh, concepts like bringing coins into circulation, you now have to put that against the dilution in the coin itself. So when we're talking about uh, the effects on the agents, we have to actually uh, correct this. So we're looking at the change, the corrected purchasing power, which is this uh, P with a hat. And it, it basically divides the system into two, uh, the two sets where you have the agents that actually receive coins or lose coins, represented by the equation at the top, and uh, their fixed uh, purchasing power within the system when new coins are introduced is represented by that formula. And of course, the agents that are not part of the change itself, which are represented by the ones in the bottom. So again, for, in this example, if more coins are somehow printed into the system, agents who do not receive coins from that minting process are actually losing purchasing power. So in Bitcoin right now, uh, agents who are receiving newly minted coins would be the miners from the block awards, the, the coin-based transactions. And agents who are not miners are actually not receiving these coins and their coins are being diluted against that. Great. So with the framework out of the way, I want to talk about the two concepts we um, mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. And the first of which is uh, proof of claim. And proof of claim is the way by which we identify lost coins uh, via process of elimination. Uh, so, again, this goes back to the fact that identifying lost coins or proving that some wallet is lost is a problematic issue because, again, if we're willing to accept uh, that someone says, yes, I lost this wallet and we're believing him, then we're introducing two problems. One, how do we know that that person actually owned the wallet to begin with? And two, even if he did own the, if he, even if he is the owner of the wallet, how do we know that he actually lost that key, and he's not just lying to get some money back from redistribution. Uh, so the only way we can basically address that issue is going at it from the other way around. And instead of actually trying to prove that coins are lost, instead proving what coins are actually still in circulation. Uh, so that is the concept we call proof of claim. Again, essentially, there's no difference between coins that are lost and those which are either not owned by someone or being hoarded. Uh, so, the nice thing about proof of claim is that there's a very natural way that already exists within Bitcoin that, to prove claim over a wallet. Because if I'm able to generate a transaction at any point in time, if I generate a tra transaction and pay someone, I am also inexplicably proving that I have access to that wallet and I'm able to transfer funds out of it. So, the nice thing about that is that transactions are sort of a natural way to prove claim over a wallet. Uh, now, in this paper, we refer to transactions which are generated solely for the purpose of uh, proof of claim as uh, proof of claim transactions. And uh, proof of claim transactions, you can think of them as transactions that are not based on the exchange of goods or services, but are rather a transaction from one individual to himself solely for the purpose of proving that he's able to do so. Uh, now, the important thing to note about that is that uh, proof of claim transactions must still in uh, impose fees on whoever's trying to uh, prove claim over a wallet because miners will be the ones that are uh, tasked with revealing these proof of claim on the blockchain as it progresses and they're therefore uh, incentivized to actually participate in the algorithm. 
so we have this nice concept of proof of claim, but now we have to talk about how we actually encourage people to do that. Because again, people are notorious, or you know, Bitcoin, for example, is notorious for having people hoarding coins from the Genesis block to this day. So how do you actually force someone to reveal their coins in the system? And a very simple idea we sort of came up with was uh, spring cleaning. And spring cleaning is basically that one day a year where you uh, decide to get off your ass and go around and clean your house so you can then justify being a slob for 364 days a year. Uh, but the point is that spring cleaning is our mechanism for incentivizing agents to provide proof of claim for their accounts. So periodically, we uh, want the system to enter what we call a spring cleaning cycle. And during that spring cleaning cycle, agents are supposed to reveal their uh, proof of claim transactions in order to provide claim for their coins. Um, you can think of it similar to the way you file tax returns and you're incentivized to file tax for tax returns because you have that one day a year. So that's, uh, that corresponds with what we call the spring cleaning here. And you're incentivized to do that because your rewards are A, you're going to get some nice tax returns, and B, hopefully you're not going to go to jail. Uh, so during spring cleaning, agents are encouraged to produce proof of claim transactions for their associated wallets. How do we do that? Uh, at the end of the cycle, unclaimed coins, any coin that hasn't had, any wallet basically, that it wasn't provided with uh, proof of claim is considered lost to the system, and all coins contained within it are liable to be redistributed after uh, spring cleaning has ended. Uh, one important thing to know is that lost coins after spring cleaning has ended are no longer usable. This is essential in order to be able to prove that agents will actually correspond with that uh, algorithm and provide honest proof of claim for their coins. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is the redistribution scheme, or who should get the uh, lost coins. Now, uh, again, going back to uh, Yermondrad and Dionysiu, uh, proposed, they proposed that miners should be the ones that get the uh, recirculated coins via block rewards in the future. The problem with that is that miners have a very, uh, a, a very uh, strong power in the blockchain which is their ability to censor transactions. Any miner, given a transaction, can decide that he, for whatever reason, doesn't want to include it on the blockchain and basically censor it on his own. So we recognize a problem where if the miners are liable to get the rewards from redistribution, why not just block everyone and receive all the coins for redistribution? So we propose, uh, instead, a proportional redistribution among all agents within the system. So a proportion of the earnings is actually based on how much proof of claim a given agent has provided. So we illustrate that with an example where agent A provided claim for his entire account of X during the last spring cleaning phase. And if at the end of the spring cleaning epsilon coins are lost, then he's liable for a reward that's proportional to the amount of coin he produced. So for example, if at the end of spring cleaning I provided proof for 10% of the entire money supply and I'm saying that's mine, then I'm going to get 10% of all coins which were considered lost after spring cleaning. Uh, but then it arises the question of, is that really what I want to do as an agent? Do I really want to pr uh, provide proof of claim for my entire account? And this leads to our first theorem. And our first theorem is that the strategy that maximizes the agent's purchasing power at the end of spring cleaning is actually declaring his entire account for proof of claim. And I came by, or we came by, the uh, um, very nice proof that you see behind me here, which is very convoluted, and I've shown it to my friends, who are no longer my friends now. But um, essentially, what we're talking about here is for reviewing the purchasing power of the agent, given delta, and delta is, a, is reporting a fraction of the account rather than the whole account. So delta can be anywhere between zero and one. And when we derive the function, happily, we, we find that act the corrected uh, purchasing power is monotonically increasing in delta, meaning that higher values of delta provide better purchasing power for the agent. So they're incentivized to provide proof for their entire account in that regard. Uh, I'm starting to run out of time, but I do want to address one last issue, which is minor compensation. And again, I talked about this before, but minor compensation is required for this protocol to work, for miners to be 
agreeing to, uh, pro to include proof of claim on the blockchain. Uh, for simplicity, we assume that fees are fixed at some price f. And basically, this is more important to note that fees are sort of disconnected from the contents of the transaction itself. So where, whether you're transferring 10 Bitcoin or 10,000 Bitcoins, the fees are the same because you're auctioning for a place for that transaction itself and not for its contents. And what we ask ourselves is, is the, that fee, is that enough reward for a miner to actually uh, include that transaction in a block and not censor it? So we get to the miner's dilemma, and I'm going to breeze through it very quickly. But uh, essentially, it looks like uh, the miner weighs inclusion versus censorship as the transaction fee versus the redistribution reward from that transaction should he censor it. Now, the nice thing to note about that is the smaller the miner's account is, which is represented by XA, then the less, then he gets lower uh, censorship rewards for censoring, and then he's liable to be more honest. Now, it gets better when we actually consider other miners within the system, and then we get something that's closer to prisoner dilemma for everyone, anyone who's familiar with that. And with that, we basically divide miners into what we call Nash miners and other miners where Nash miners will be miners whose accounts are so small that they're always liable to be honest and include accounts. And because of the existence of Nash miners within the system, we argue that other miners should also comply with the algorithm because otherwise their rewards for censoring a transaction is none. Uh, so I have no time to talk about conclusions or get to questions, but thank you all for listening.